While kiddish clubs have been around for quite some time, there has not actually been much studied or otherwise written on them, that is, until now. That's something we're going to be discussing here on the 124th episode of The Jewish Shrinking Show, bringing L'Chaim to life. Hello, everybody. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan. I'm very excited to welcome first-time guest to the show, Dr. Michal Shaul. Dr. Shaul, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. (laughs) Absolutely. All right, for those less familiar with Dr. Shaul, she is the chair and senior lecturer in the Department of History at Herzog College in Israel. She won the Shazar Prize for Research in Jewish History six, seven years ago. Her book, Holocaust Memory and Ultra-Orthodox Society in Israel, was published in Hebrew and English. Her work about different aspects of the religious commemoration of the Holocaust was published in various journals, such as Yad Vashem Studies, Jewish Culture and History, Journal of Israeli History, and many more. During 2016 through 2018, she was a scholar in residence at the Jewish Holocaust Center in Melbourne, Australia. While living in Melbourne, she was exposed to the central role of the communal Kiddush in shul and started to study it. The first chapter of her Kiddush study project, ooh, it's a first study, uh, first chapter, Kiddush Club, Fraternity, Authority, Class, and Gender Challenges in the Modern Orthodox Synagogue was published in Contemporary Jewry just this past August. So, Dr. Shaul, welcome. Thank you. Absolutely. So, I, I just thought it was a one-off, but so this is a whole project you're doing into researching Kiddush stuff? Yes, but uh, as you said... I'm a historian, and my expertise being the study of the memory of the Holocaust. So that mm-hmm. should be your first. That should be your first question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> what, what made me go from Kiddush Hashem to Kiddush clubs? <laughs> okay. You can, I, or maybe you could have researched Kiddush during the Holocaust. What people yeah. did to drink? I don't know. But usually, all right. So fine. You know, I'll, I'll pick up on the string. How did you go from the Holocaust study to this? People ask me. Did it, you know, uh, research and moral deterioration from studying high quality, even sacred issues to dealing with popular and esoteric esoteric culture. And I admit that friends and colleagues raised an eyebrow when they heard what I was working on. It all started completely by chance. Uh, So as you said, I I, I lived with my family for two years in Melbourne, Australia. Mm -hmm. I was there as a researcher at the Holocaust Museum. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we dove in there in the Mizrahi Hishul. Mm-hmm. And one Shabbos, my daughter, who was four years old at the time, asked me to go out- outside with her in the middle of the prayer. As we disembarked from the women's section, I suddenly recognized that something was happening. I didn't know what's <laughs> going on there. Yeah. So men left the prayer hall and began to organize something in the side hall. And it was very strange because I knew that it was still quite a long time until Kiddush. <laughs> so uh, I looked at them and asked them, what's going on here? What mm-hmm. are you doing? That's how uh, this journey of observations and oversights and interviews there and in other shows it all started in this accident. <laughs> <laughs> and I started looking into this phenomenon that I didn't know from home. Mm-hmm. And I wrote this academic article that you mentioned of this the secret world of Kiddush clubs mm-hmm. that was and thankfully I got some very good feedback so here I am well I mean and- so you published this article it gets published this just this past summer I stumbled upon it in September right around the Chagim and it was certainly a fascinating study for a variety of reasons but this is only is this only the beginning of a project this isn't just an article it'll be more yes Okay, so what what what's the whole entire scope of this project? Is it all yeah, about Kiddush clubs write... or Kiddush in general? No, no, Kiddush, Kiddush in general. And uh, surprisingly, no one ever written about it. And you're saying just a, Kiddush. Forget a... about Kiddush clubs no one's written on, but even Kiddush yeah. generally? Even Kiddush. You know, just uh, Samuel Hellman wrote, uh, I don't know, half a chapter in, the, in his uh, famous book about the uh, synagogue life. Mm-hmm. But... Uh, I, I asked Professor Sana, I wanted to read about it, not to write about it. When when I first introduced this, this phenomenon, you know, in, mm-hmm. in where I live, I live in a yishuv in Gush Etzion. Mm-hmm. We have one Kiddush in the yeah. entire year, in, the, in Simchat Torah. Oh, so, wow. And when, I real, and when I realized that in Melbourne, just as in Mizrahi Shul, you know, in, you know that you live in the States, that there mm-hmm. are a few minions in this center. Mm-hmm. There were five cent- five minions in the Mizrahi Center, and each one of them conducted the Kiddush weekly. Mm-hmm. 
it's so important for so many Jews. That's the most the the Jewish experience of the week, and apparently so central. Mm-hmm. How come no one had ever written about it? You're saying it's social so, history, right? A social history. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, as opposed to maybe a halachic uh, normative sort of approach to it, but you're saying it's social history. Yes. Okay. So, so basically, if, if you ask me, how did I go from from Holocaust to <laughs> to Kiddush? Mm-hmm. I think it's it's what I the shift I made. It's not so dramatic because I I was always interested in questions like how does a community created and how, how does it go and what motivates people? Well, also Jewish and, life. Yeah, stuff. And it, it's Jewish really life. about liveliness in Jewish life. Yeah. Yeah, grassroots history. Okay. Okay. Wait, I'm so I'm really shocked. So Kiddush clubs, I, I mean, I have a lot of questions on, but you're saying even just Kiddishes in general, just really. Yeah, I think it's going to, hopefully you're going to invite me again for your next, uh, yes. next coming episodes. Yeah. And, and we discussed uh, my next, my next chapter chapter that's going to be published in July, mm-hmm. it's going to be Kiddush as a Carnival. Wow. And I think okay. it's fascinating. Great. I'm, if I okay. can say. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a good tease for the future. Okay. Yeah. So, you know what? I, I'm just going to start off. I know this was, I don't know if this was covered in your article or not. How far back do Kiddush clubs date? Because I okay. don't uh, like, in addition to obviously nothing ever having been written about them, but also it's hard to discover information about Kiddush clubs because, as opposed to shuls or even just Kiddishes, that stuff is going to be published on websites, on newsletters. It's going to be out there. It's going to be very public information. But Kiddush clubs don't rely on information that's just out there. They don't necessarily promote or otherwise publicize information about themselves. They happen, yeah. and. Uh, aside from that, I mean, I know 2004, 2005, there were the Orthodox Union in America published, you know, some sort of letter of concern that these should stop. So I don't know if it's a rather recent phenomenon in the last two, three decades. Um, what what have you discovered about the, the recentness or history of, of them? Despite the proliferation of the Kiddush clubs, the phenomenon has not been at the focus of synagogue research, surprisingly. Mm-hmm. And of course, I couldn't examine all the synagogues in the Western world and all the Kiddushim that are performed in each one of them, not even some of them, Mm -hmm. for sure, yeah? Uh, But I've gathered the information about Kiddush clubs from, firstly, from the observations I made uh, during Kiddush club meetings in the synagogue in Melbourne, Australia. Mm -hmm. I made some interviews with members of uh, various Kiddush clubs in in Israel and in the USA. Mm -hmm. I sent a questionnaire to my students and colleagues, and which was answered by hundreds of national religious Jews living in Israel. Mm-hmm. And from information that can be found on the internet and the social media, I did find mm. uh, things. And apparently, I discovered that from a historical perspective, the Kiddush Club is less postmodern, less uh, innovative, less Ashkenazi, and less subversive than a- appears at first sight. <laughs> Moreover, the, the custom of going out for a drink in the middle of the prayer service is not an exclusively Ashkenazi practice, but r- rather one that has been found to exist in other contemporary ethnic communities as well, like oh, such really? as Moroccan, yeah, yeah. and Tunisian, uh-huh. and Yemenite communities. Wow. Uh, this, they don't call it Kiddush clubs, and they don't they don't consume whiskey, but rather uh, wine or arak. Or mafia. Yeah. Mafia, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, so um, they, drink, they drink inside a shoot. The, the spider, they don't go out. They bring the bottom in. Ah. So, <laughs> yeah. is that, w- but when is that during the services? Is that at the conclusion around Haftara? When is that? Around Haftara, yeah. Oh, really? It's, wow. a, ref- it's, a, it's a refreshment, you know. Wow, that's actually it, really good. I think it all begins. It all begins because the the davening the the prayer is too long. Yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's a good it's, it's a good intermission to bring in the machia or the Iraq during haftar. That's great. Um, actually, you know what? Since you started talking about geography, so one thing that blew my mind in the article, even though it might sound kind of obvious, but I, I just had never experienced or otherwise thought about this. It really, you position it as really an, a sort of an Anglo-Jewry phenomenon, whether South Africa, Australia, UK, US, Canada, 
um, certain, um, uh, I mean, that, that was so f- fascinating. I mean, it does, I guess now a little bit in Israel, you mentioned, but how did you discover that? I think it all started because of my question as a historian. I mm-hmm. asked, where did it all start? When did it all start? Where did it all start? Mm-hmm. And I think this phenomenon, you know, as a historian, I ask, what, what the story is part of something bigger. Mm. So what's what's the bigger story? Yeah. And I realized this this phenomenon of the Kiddush Club should be examined as part of the male uh, urban experience, mm. the club culture in general and wine clubs in particular. So the Kiddush Club is usually a male bonding experience. Mm. So I thought it's similar to the 19th century gentlemen's club and mm. other type of men only club clubs mm-hmm. so it designed to to allow men to relax and bond with one another mm-hmm. and if if you think not in jewish perspective in uh, modern perspe- perspective so mm-hmm. clubbing is the most common international urban experience among young men hmm. Espe- especially among the financially secure really and specifically on week mm. on on weekends Hmm. So it's it's a Jewish experience, but it's a part of a global experience. Hmm. So I think that you you should look at it. And I I, I heard that you mentioned in the previous chapter mm-hmm. uh, about Kiddush Club. You interviewed someone else. You mentioned it that you bumped into this uh, blog of it's called Sephorim that mentions uh, um, yes the Sephorim uh, blog yeah responsa yeah. yeah that apparently. It mentioned that in the 16th century in Ashkenaz, yeah. there were young men uh, uh, walking out of shul in order to, <laughs> to drink a little. So yeah, it goes back. It's not you. I guess maybe part of my question is maybe this. I don't know. Maybe this particular expression of the phenomenon. Maybe that's more re- like I don't know what prompts. Maybe I have to ask the Orthodox Union people. But what prompts this letter in 2005? Was it not that common in America? Maybe. Per- particularly to America, maybe not that common pre-2000. Yeah. I don't know. So the debate in the last two decades uh, has increased increased in both directions, I think. So mm. the, the Kiddush Club has become a more organized and more uh, lavish event, and it mm-hmm. grows more vigorous and more organized criticism. So it goes uh-huh. together. And I think the, the current, you know, what uh, the straw that... Uh, how do you call it? How do you say that? I need your the help. straw the that sh- broke the camel's back. Exactly. So yeah. the straw that broke the camel's back is mm-hmm. a, a terrible incident that uh, kids were brought to the hospital because of overuse. They they drank too much. That made uh, the rabbis of the OU to to do, uh, to to ban the kiddush club. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far with Dr. Shaul on her research into Kiddush Clubs. If you like Kiddush Clubs and hearing about various experiences, here's a sneak peek into next week's episode. Those who like like it and appreciate the social concept, mm-hmm. they they want to see it like, uh, I mean, they don't want to, listen, you do it in the kitchen, right on the stainless steel top, you know, over there, and with just, you know, a couple of time, it feels like we're doing it in hiding. And they yes. say it's a positive social thing. Mm-hmm. Why don't we do it like a little more proper, you know, at the table with, with you know, a little bit more than just, you know, a little a bite or two. I mean, that's mm-hmm. how they feel about it. I hope you enjoy that sneak peek into next week's episode, which I hope you come back and listen to. Now back into this episode featuring Dr. Shaul. Rabbis, I, I, for sure, they, they went against it because they, they slammed the Kiddush Club for detracting from the honor of the synagogues mm-hmm. for uh, promoting the shonara you know gossip and causing oh, wow. causing participants participants to re- return to to musaf in a state of intoxication mm-hmm. and uh, the most the, the most important thing that they were enabling substance abuse that's what they said mm. that they said that the kirsch club promotes both underage and excessive drinking and it should be banned because it, it, they they take it take um take place during 
the service. Mm-hmm. It set a very bad example for the kids, mm-hmm. and it's dangerous. Mm-hmm. So how come, like you know? In all places, Shul would be the, the the place that kids are introduced to alcohol. It's also interesting. I heard uh, recently, I was at someone's house and the, the wife was complaining, like, why do they need to go out? They can't wait just a little bit longer. <laughs> just a little bit longer. Just make it through Musa. Um, I imagine also rabbis are, yeah. in addition to missing Haftarah, although, that I mean, it's really not that important to miss, but maybe the rabbi speech which for the rabbi is important to them. And also you mentioned the honor of the synagogue, but also the honor due to the rabbi. So I think that could be, you know, the rabbi, no rabbi is going to be, you're missing both the Haftorah and the, and the, and my own, my own speech, but then also to come back, right. In in a different state of a little bit inebriated, I guess that, that varies, whether it's just a, a little bit versus, you know, if people are stumbling back in, that may not be, the type of behavior they want to see certainly not right. of course it's an it's an insult to the rabbi mm-hmm. uh, yeah. and if people walk out right before he speaks yeah and moreover the the word kiddush mm-hmm. means uh, the creation of a holiness mm-hmm. so the the existence of kiddush clubs as an alternative ritual during the the prayer service appears to undermine the sacred nature of the synagogue you know mm. if, if you look at it mm. the, the core of the ritual is all those things that are forbidden in the prayer hall like you can't drink drinking and mm-hmm. eating and schmoozing mm-hmm. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> in contrast to the holiness the kedusha of the house of prayer mm-hmm. and the atmosphere that created in the kish club is inevitably you know, superficial. It's it's not the avira that is wanted in the show. The atmosphere. So, so, uh, so atmosphere. okay. So let me let me double click into something. So clearly, there are detractors. There are downsides, but there are clearly upsides. So, mm-hmm. can we just double click more into what you mentioned? The gentlemen's clubs. What what to use different language? What job does that get done? Like, what is it doing for the men? It, I mean, what do mm-hmm. the men get out of it? And what I don't know, maybe for a broader perspective, why, you know, 1920 and now into the 21st century in the West, why, what, yeah. what, what is this doing for the men? When I first introduced to this phenomenon, I was mm-hmm. a complete stranger. I, I would mm-hmm. say an alien, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm a woman, <laughs> I'm yeah. a guest in the community, I'm a foreigner, and mm-hmm. I don't drink. Mm-hmm. I'm a... <laughs> so a real outsider. <laughs> Yes, a real chutznik. <laughs> okay, but it, it's a real chutznik, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, but apparently, it was a great advantage mm-hmm. because I was very curious and asked many questions, and I didn't take anything for granted. Mm-hmm. And for the first time, and uh, I think my my husband is very thankful. <laughs> so <laughs> I I I looked at this phenomenon in, in, with empathy to men's need Mm -hmm. because uh, I I saw they need to be just themselves without Mm -hmm. the the wife, their wives watching eyes. And uh, (laughs) Mm -hmm. because uh, researchers see clubbing as, uh, you know, in general, exciting and multi-sensorial experience uh, for body and mind. Mm-hmm. And it provides uh, both tranquility and respite from the intensity of urban life. Mm. And I yeah. think that uh, spending time together in the same room, uh, drinking and eating together, creates a social cir- circle that confirms the group identity and mm. individual social status. So mm. in terms of that, you know, uh, I, I, I'm really aware, as, as we said, that about the, the rabbis' criticism, not only the rabbis, mm-hmm. people in the in communities that mm-hmm. uh, hate Kiddush Club. And, <laughs> and, but you can see that that it, it gives something, it meets the needs that the shul can't. Like, mm-hmm. you know, shul is it's also, it's also a social club. 
mm-hmm. but this uh, intimacy it's it's very engaging mm-hmm If if Shul and, uh, is the is the is Kodesh, then Kiddush Club is Kodesh Kodashim, right? It's more of an inner elite <laughs> circle. <laughs> okay, that's a drush on Kiddush Clubs. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, actually, I'm Very really good. curious. You, you started mentioning about the gender aspects. It's primarily men. I know you mentioned in your article some might might open themselves up to having women. So there could be a bit of a bit of a mixed gender, although I imagine those are in the minority. Yeah. What was it for you, your experience, you started to mention, but what was it for you to experience that, especially, you know, to appreciate, you know, what your husband was saying, you know, to have that, that man time, but what was it, you know, on the flip side, this isn't going to make it into your article, but what was your experience perceiving this? This, it was a very gendered space. Yes, it is. Uh, but it was for me, it was an opportunity. It was a eye opener. I like it. Mm-hmm. it I discovered a whole world that I wasn't aware of <laughs> and yeah and I I now see that you know also in academia in the academia I was surrounded by men and hmm. especially I think religious religious men that grew up in a homosocial society se- separate from a social society mm-hmm. they need their space they need their space and mm-hmm. Yeah, I respect that. Can, can I ask you, I mean, it's probably super obvious, but I'm just going to ask it anyways. So it's nice that the men have these designated sort of men's spaces. But have you found, yeah. are there specific women's spaces that correspondingly so? Or they Not in shul, happen? though. Not in shul, right. But Not in shul. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, in the home. You, or, expect to, you expect to meet, to see uh, kiddush clubs for, for they did. They are. They are. So I wasn't even asking that, although I'm really curious. I really just mean if if really the point, uh, I'm sorry, not the point, uh, a major advantage for having Kiddush Club is it's a men's only space to sort of let their hair down, you know, metaphorically speaking, yeah. to just be themselves yeah. amongst without the watchful eye of the women or the critical yeah. ears, so to speak. But now what's corresponding for the women? It doesn't have to take place in the shul, but are there women's only spaces right. that they're taking advantage of? Of course there are, but... We, I, I don't know. I, I didn't. It's not my research. I didn't do any research about the the women's meeting. But I can tell you from my experience mm-hmm. that sometimes we use this time that you're you're in shul mm-hmm. <laughs> to meet and mm-hmm. have a uh, not not whiskey but coffee mm-hmm. and uh, have co- coffee together. That's what we drink. Like it's it's basically the same. Yeah. We sit and and drink and have our pace yeah. without you and yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're yeah. happy. Right. I mean, there's something to be, I keep using this this term, the job to get done. But, you know, for the women, that's their opportunity to have this women's only space. And Kiddush Club is, I guess, the men's opportunity to use this as a men's only yeah. space. And it also is used to, to good things, like also for fellowship. I think that the contemporary race of life and technological development make human interpersonal meetings with friends increasingly rare. So mm. the meeting at the synagogue on Shabbos um, constitutes an opportunity for a social encounter mm-hmm. and the manifestation of community identity. So mm-hmm. as religious men, they were brought up in a mostly or partly homosocial social education system. Having fun while hanging out with the boys is mm-hmm. for them the most natural mm. it's a home mm. and the dynamic male bond created in homosocial settings such as combat units and de- develops men's that that's how what researchers say that it develops mm. men's emotional expressiveness mm. and impacts men relationships beyond the homosexual so homosocial enclave mm-hmm. so This happens in modern fraternities such as Odd Fellows, which promote philanthropy and ethic of fellowship and charity. I want to claim that a careful analysis of the Kiddush Club polemic indicates that if you if you blame the Kiddush Club members that no, 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 and they're mm-hmm. not okay, mm-hmm. their responses are being very defensive. And mm-hmm. they... I, I find their responses uh, that they reflect an effort to to justify their actions. Mm. They insist that 
th- what they're doing is harmless. Uh, and not only that it's harmless, uh, you know, nothing wrong to, to, to have a bit of Lechaim and some camaraderie. Mm-hmm. And they said, but and they say it's not only that it's a co- kosher atmosphere uh, for socializing they they say that they give to the they give to the community mm. because they they say they have a point they say that it, the kiddush club actually lessens the phenomenon of chatting during the prayer service <laughs> after all because they say it's easier to restrain oneself and avoid small talk when you know that there will soon be an opportunity for a, a social encounter. Also, and that the people who are most likely to chatter will just leave. So you, exactly. Yeah. Right. It, it's hmm. a step up. If, yeah. if it wasn't for the Kiddush Club, they, they weren't coming to Shul at all. <laughs> so good thing they come. Mm-hmm. Good thing they come. Mm-hmm. And, they, they, you know, they could have made... They could have met in somewhere else and and drink and go to the club or go to a pub or wherever. But they do come to shul and they do do their job. You know, they, they daven. Mm-hmm. They come. They daven. They're part of the community. They they sit with their friend with Jewish Jewish friends and just have some fun. Mm-hmm. And you know, they also sponsor. There's a battle sponsorship. And they, there's a charity and mm-hmm. a lot of money for charity. Mm. You can call it fun, right? Fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> I have a totally separate question. You mentioned at the outset you got a lot of questions as far as this transition of focus of research going from Holocaust to Kiddush. Mm-hmm. My my question is: now that you published this this past summer, what ha- what types of responses have you encountered received? As far as, I mean, especially, you know, to the article specifically and sort of to your research in Kiddush clubs in general. You're right. In the past, uh, writing about a popular issue was considered unacademic. But oh, really? I believe that, yeah, because, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what's with your silliness? So, yeah. 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 I believe that in 2023, it is no longer necessary to defend the importance of dealing with microhistory and specify mm-hmm. the the potential of this method to illuminate new angles of the mm-hmm. the great questions mm-hmm. that researchers have been considered with uh, concerned with forever yeah Wait, so, you're, because you're as you know alongside alongside the heavyweight issues at stake Judaism includes elements of entertainment which is mm-hmm. part of any culture yeah so I think to in in order to understand better, uh, to better understand Judaism and our culture and Jewish civilization, mm-hmm. you must include not only the suffering, <laughs> but also, you know, the it's part of our culture. And of course, mm-hmm. wine and drinking. I don't have to tell you, you're the number one export, <laughs> and it's part of our culture. Absolutely. So it sounds like your response here is specifically to fellow academics. Is that what they're asking yes. you? Okay, so that's really fascinating to have, you know, what you're saying about the microhistories. What about a broader, uh, broader pop, not just restricted yeah. to the academy, the broader responses? What have you received or heard? Okay. It, it was, it was very, it was fascinating mm-hmm. because, you know, people from Shul that I interviewed, I interviewed the members of the Kiddush Club. They mm-hmm. could have swear that there is no Kiddush Club in their shul. And so ever, <laughs> we never heard of this phenomenon. <laughs> I said, you have it, you know, for 10 or 20 years, every Shabbos, <laughs> but they weren't aware of it. Wow. You just weren't invited. That's the, <laughs> that's the thing. I get all kinds of responses. Uh, yeah. People are shocked. Yeah. People are happy that I told their story mm. and, and concluded it into the, the big story. Mm-hmm. And now they're part of the sh- of the sh- shul life. See, the, the synagogue's life is uh, is much more than davening. Mm. You know, it's it's a whole world in America for sure, and you know, in overseas, not in Israel. In Israel, it's a different story. Mm-hmm. But you know, in America, Jewish life is is around shul, and mm-hmm. it's you know, davening is one part and. And I'm mm-hmm. not sure it's the most important one. 
and uh, yeah. it's a Saturday morning club, and that's what mm. fascinates me. Hey there, I hope you're enjoying the show. I want to break in. If you are enjoying this content, if you enjoy the show, if you enjoy other content I publish here with whether the Jewish Drinking Show or JewishDrinking.com, it's not just a website. It's not just the internet. I also exist in real life. I've spoken here in Southwest Ohio, as well as just the other month out of town in a couple of different places, both Midwest, East Coast. I'm happy to actually bring Jewish drinking content to you, whether JCC, synagogue, Jewish organization, you don't even have to be a Jewish organization. You want to pay me? You want to have me bring insightful and lively content your way? Happy to do so. You can feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com, and we can see how we can bring the Chaims to life. All right, now back into the show. Rabbi Drew, are you a Kiddush Club member? I, I, it's, a, it's a great question. So my local shul does not have memberships per se. It's more of an ad hoc getting together. Few guys on once in a blue moon, a woman will be there. But really, it's it's a guy space. We have some crackers, we have some meat, we have wine. Uh, once in a, once in a while, maybe even some whiskey or tequila, and then. Meanwhile, a few weeks ago, I spent Shabbat by my sister in Massachusetts, and the Kiddush Club there was organized. They had not only memberships, but people used paid memberships into a bank account, and they used the bank account to buy their booze, their crackers, their their nosh, their snacks for the Kiddush Club. And it was a very different set of, of an arrangement. Right. So I, I imagine I can only imagine it just continues to get more and more diverse and, and variations on the theme of how organized or I know you mentioned in the course of the of the show, the conversation about having even bottle sponsorship. So that's even another level. Of, I imagine you can have people saying we're going to there's so many different ways people can get organized about this or have who's bringing the bottle this week or next week or is there a, what type of food are we bringing? So I imagine it's a huge variety around these issues. This was the most uh, um, interesting part of our discussion. Oh, okay. And I wonder if you if you read my article, does it sound familiar? Yes. Like I mean, you identify your, your club in what I've written? Well, it's such a variety. I mean, yes. some of this is really just what do people experience? And so it's mm-hmm. kind of like anthropological field notes because there's no, A, there's no playbook aside from there's right. drinking. I mean, yes, it's typically wine or scotch, sometimes bourbon, very rarely tequila or rum. But that, I mean, we happen to have a it's tequila in the guy. Of, but you're going during yeah, so the haftarah? Yeah, the haftarah comes out. We we uh, go to our designated spot, which sometimes yeah. changes. And then some of us try to make it back in time before the rabbi speech. And then some of us, that's not a priority. And they just try to make it back for Musaf or at some point in Musaf. So it, it can vary. And so, it's it's a mix. It's usually the same few guys. But then you can have a three to five other guys who might join in depending upon the week. In rich communities, uh, members of Kilshad may drink whiskey that cost as much as hundreds of dollars per bottle. Mm-hmm. While in more modest Kiddush Club, less pricey and more standard fare is served yet mm-hmm. they will still be presented as exclusive like you must taste this mm-hmm. crackers like it's unbelievable yeah <laughs> and it's not only about money it's also about social capital mm. because um gossiping and joke telling and mm-hmm. it inc- increased social capital and mm-hmm. often you often used as a means to climb the social ladder because uh, they disclose hmm. that one man is in possession of certain information, others uh, are not. Hmm. And you're right, there is no book. So because most <laughs> Kiddush Club represent the character of their extended community. Hmm. So for example, in large established Jewish communities like the one you were in Boston, Mm-hmm. where there are designated minions by age and economic status, the clubs will be also fairly homogeneous. Mm. Like It means that there are clubs for young men, for uh, fathers of small ch- children, and clubs for middle-aged men. And of mm. course, the different stage of life of the participants dictates the character of the club and the topics of conversation that arise in it. Mm-hmm. So in smaller and or more diverse communities, 
like the one you're a member of, the Kiddush Club will also be uh, multi-age and socioeconomically diverse. Al although for the most part, the members will be from established class that can afford to purchase uh, quality alcohol. Mm. So, and also, you know, I found out that most of the Israeli Kiddush Clubs take place at private homes after shul. Oh, interesting. So, Mm. Those groups often called, they, they don't call themselves Kirsch clubs, but a parliament. So I think <laughs> this mirrors the, the less central role of the synagogue as a social institution within Israeli life mm -hmm. and the importance of parliament, you know. <laughs> and uh, of course, in, in some egalitarian communities, especially in the U.S., women also take part. Mm -hmm. Important to, to mention. However, usually the Kirsch club is planned and organized in the men's section. Mm -hmm. Women usually attend the, the communal kiddush after, yeah. after the service. Yeah. Um, there are also <laughs> all kinds of, of kiddush clubs. You know, in, in more uh, uh, Torani uh, communities, they, they sit and, and say divrei Torah. <laughs> and, and the alcohol, alcohol is only accompanied uh, the, the, the shiur. Mm -hmm. But more likely, there are no divret Torah whatsoever. I wanted to break in really briefly. I'm Rabbi Drew, your host and founder of JewishDrinking.com. Turns out, as of this fall, the IRS has recognized Jewish Drinking as a 501c3 organization. You are always welcome to make donations. If you have any questions how to do so, you can check out the website or even simply email me at Drew at JewishDrinking.com. Thank you. Now back into the show. So the kiddish stuff you said you're this is a the one part this is one published piece you have a broader kiddish project so this is a small piece of the broader kiddish project right. so what uh what are you planning on to do research wise for the broader kiddish project another chapter that should should have been the first so the kiddish mm -hmm. club it's it's this exclusive club mm -hmm. but my the 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 big chapter that should have been the first that is going to be published next July, mm -hmm. is, as I, as I mentioned, uh, it's about Kiddush as a carnival. So mm -hmm. that's about the communal Kiddush mm -hmm. that is antithetical to Kiddush Club. It's not, Kiddush Club is the exclusive club for men only, mm -hmm. and it takes, um, it happens during the prayer, but the communal Kiddush is after the service, mm -hmm. and it's for the whole congregation, and that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. So, the first chapter is, or not the first chapter, the next chapter that is going to be published is about this communal kiddush that mm -hmm. it's in in all in all the it's all worldwide, all over. And another chapter is going to be about. Wait, can I ask you a yeah? quick question? I mean, something I have discovered sure. is it depends. So. Orthodox and I think conservative synagogues will have kiddush during the daytime, but reform synagogues don't necessarily have daytime services. They might just have Friday night services. So they might serve right. some stuff Friday night, but it's 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 a different um, articulation. It's a different expression of kiddush. Right, and I also mm -hmm. found kiddush on Sunday or Monday or Thursday night. They call really? it kiddush. <laughs> really, but it's a, it's actually social gathering, mm -hmm. and that's why I called this article that. To be published, mm -hmm. its title is going to be "Happy Hour." Mm. So it's okay. you know it's it's they call it kiddush, mm -hmm. but it has nothing to do with the religious duty to recite kiddush the kiddush bracha. Mm. You know sometimes they do say the kiddush bracha, but the bracha, but it's not it's not the main thing about kiddush. Mm -hmm. It's the the social part of shul or the social part of the community, mm -hmm. the gathering and. Surrounding food, and mm -hmm. and you can find it th this kind of thing uh, in not in the Jewish version, and also in church, and also in other mm -hmm. clubs. And um, the question I'm asking myself is, what's Jewish about it? Mm -hmm. If it's Jewish at all, so that's gonna I'm gonna give you all this story. Uh, hopefully, next time you'll invite me for Wonderful. another <laughs> another episode. Absolutely, uh, but. Absolutely. As a historian, I want to 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 do a research. That's what I'm focusing on now mm -hmm. about the historical sources of Kiddush. You know, Avraham Abinu 
didn't go for kiddush. The Rashi didn't have a kiddush in his shul. When did it uh, all I mean, start? Avraham, I mean, Avraham like, did have a mishta gadol. Avraham did when uh, yeah, when Yitzchak was born. Like when they weaned him after he was born, but when they weaned him off. So there are five mishta yes, in in right, Sefer Breshit, and that one is the only mishta gadol. That's, that's a really big drinking party. So, but you can say that the Hashverosh <laughs> also had a mishta. There are lots of so, mishtaot. There are li- actually se- uh, se- Megillat Esther has the most mishtaot out of any Sefer Tanakh. It's like over 20 different mishtaot in that book. Right. Yeah. So, but I mean, in, in terms of Kiddush, like as we know it after ah, Shul, yeah. and now it's so pop- popular. Mm-hmm. That, like you, when you grew up, there was Kiddush, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe when your parents grew up. But I'm not sure in, that in the 19th century. Maybe, mm. No, in the 19th century also. But when did it all start? It's it's not an ancient thing. You're saying it's like not. these communal at shul kiddushes. That's the, uh, yes, uh-huh. kiddush kiddush luncheon. Interesting. So I asked uh, Professor Sana, and he said, "I don't know. I'm waiting mm. for your conclusion." And this this Professor Sana is the same who was the guest on the hundredth episode of the Jewish Drinking Show. I'm excited for your research, and you know, maybe you'll even come to Cincinnati. <laughs> Hopefully, I wish. Hopefully. All right. I know you have my uh, Professor Michael Meyer in your city. About the tension in the community mm-hmm. uh, around Kiddush Club. Mm-hmm. So there are congregants and position holders in the synagogue who can be modern in their being and lifestyle, mm-hmm. yet in the sacred space and time that is on Shabbos and in the synagogue, they are obsessive with the order and casting of the synagogue and fight whoever tries to violate them. So the mm. members of the Kiddush Club, those men who drink during the prayer service are perceived by them as a real threat to the honor of the synagogue Wow! and the future of the youth. And so they act to restrain them. Mm. So uh, I think that my, my article uh, sheds light on the socially orthodox, orthodox group. That is the mm. members of the group who are interested in being part of orthodoxy because mm-hmm. what it offers them socially mm-hmm. and the religious ritual and faith faith and other on the other hand uh, hold a secondary place if at all mm. but but i think that mm. these two groups pull in opposite directions are mutually depend and dependent and rely one on another to play mm-hmm. their role because mm-hmm. the liberal group relies on the strict one to maintain the boundaries of the halacha so that they will be they will be able to violate them by mm-hmm. playing beside the borderline. Mm-hmm. And these guys couldn't be able to leave the prayer hall if they hadn't relied on the other congregants to continue with the prayer service. Mm-hmm. So on the other hand, if those enemies from within hadn't challenged them, the fundamentalist would would have nothing to do and they wouldn't have been able to define their identity as the keepers of the sacred order hmm. so both groups are part of the community and that's what keeps it going wow that's a good tension well dr shul this has been fascinating this has been insightful before we go is there anything that you would like to promote uh, not yet just okay. the article that was published thank you for the opportunity absolutely and uh, hopefully just the the first steps of the my big journey. Great. I'm excited and I'm sure our listeners are also looking to go on that journey with you. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Welcome well, aboard. Yes. All right. Well, with that, Dr. Shul, thank you so much and L'chaim. Thank you. L'chaim.